The following episode is of a sensitive nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi everyone, welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. I'm so glad we're back. It feels like we were gone for a while, right? This break seems longer than, than usual, but it's the same length as always been. Maybe it's because we've both just been having so much stuff going on in the background. Oh God, you guys have no idea. We have been going through it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. New year, new well. New year, new start, all that all that great stuff. We hope that you guys have had a great start to your new year. As I said, we're just really excited to be back and we've um we've really missed you guys. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. So of course, coming back, we're coming back one week early for because we always allow an extra week for Black History Month because it starts actually next month. But we at Genealogy Adventures like to give it at least five Sundays. Um, and of course, although we weren't able to put our schedule out there for you guys like we normally do, don't worry, don't fret. We have great shows lined up for you. Yep, and those shows will be posted um, in the coming week. So you guys can have the, the running calendar for our Black History section. So today, because Donnie and I were kind of talking about how we wanted to open the show, we knew it was going to be a conversational show with, ju with just the two of us. And thanks to Florida, Florida kind of gave us um, our topic for today. Which, which is why we had that disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a touchy subject. Um, we're talking about why our history, why Black history is so threatening. Like, what is the problem? Mm -hmm. So... so um, sometimes it's Donnie who leads on this, but this time it was me, because I saw some craziness that had been happening down in Florida about an AP, Black History course. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, an AP course is a special kind of course. It is a university prepar preparatory level course. You take it, you get credits that get applied. To, to whatever university degree that you decide to do. So it's not your average everyday kind of high school course. And it's a very, very specific kind of course. And I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that, Donia. I mean, an AP course can be anything from uh, any of your regular courses, like history, math, mm -hmm. um, English. It's just a higher level of it. So basic, it, to be straightforward, an AP course is a college level. So if yeah. you're in high school and you be, you've gone through all of your English classes, you can now go and take a college English class, which will already give you credit towards your college class. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I took them when I was in high school. And the great thing about them is it really does get you prepared for university level study. So you're used, you know, you're basically using university level books resources but more importantly you know mine was mostly kind of history and english and, and language based it made it taught us how to have university level discussions in class debates um, we learned how to write college level thesis papers or at least we started to learn how to do those things so we we, we were already beginning to develop our kind of college level academic study research discussion tools. And I, I think that's what's really important about these courses. And the thing that really piqued my interest about what was happening down with the Board of Education of Florida and Ron DeSantis was this was the only AP course in Florida that got rejected. I'm going to use a very specific word because as many of you know, I come from a marketing and communications background. So uh, words are important to me. So basically everyone is saying that this course has been banned. 
In my opinion, it hasn't been banned. It has been suspended. Banned means it can never be taught and they will never revisit this course. That's mm-hmm. not what's happening. It's basically been rejected. It's been suspended for the time being. And the people who came up with the curriculum have been inv- re-invited to make the changes that Florida wants to see, which are problematic, and we will catch up to that um, through the show. But they've been invited to revise the course, make the changes that the, that the Florida Board of Education wants to see, and then they can resubmit it, in which case it will either be approved or not approved. So we know Florida has passed, the, and many other states have passed a lot of restrictions about what can and can't be taught and specifically in in K through 12 education. And it always seems African-American history is the one thing that gets caught in the crossfire between all of these conservative states. And we're talking about, you know, specifically with governors. So we're talking about Glenn, Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, Tate Reeves in Mississippi, Greg Abbott in Texas, Kim Reynolds in Arkansas, Brian Kemp in Georgia, Brad Little in Idaho, and many, many others. This is happening all across the country. And I know that you have, you have a thought about that, Donia. Um, you know, my thought is, oh, <laughs> y'all know I'm the, I'm the rebel. So, um, yeah, no, seriously, I, I, I do. I think that this is just the subject that has been needed to be something that has to be talked about. I think definitions need to be defined. I think everything needs to be defined. I think people really need to know and understand exactly what these things are meaning and how it affects us as African-Americans and things of that nature. So, yeah. Because we're going to get into CRT in a little bit, but really kind of listening to specifically Ron DeSantis's comments about the course and other governors who've come up with anti-CRT legislation when CRT has never been taught in high schools to begin with, but that's by the by. The one thing that was kind of common in everything that they were saying is like, well, our state already teaches about slavery. We teach slavery up to emancipation. And I was on the phone with Donia this morning when that little light bulb went off and I'm like, that's kind of telling. And they kind of said the quiet part out loud by emphasizing that they only teach it up to emancipation, meaning that the history of Black people in this country is just about slavery and just about emancipation. And it's like, we have a long kind of tragic, horrible history that stretches from emancipation to today. It's like they just want to hop, hop over all of those generations and all of the, that's over a hundred years worth of history, almost to pretend like it didn't happen. I mean, if you really want to get into numbers and things of that nature, when you take the next time they talk, to, if, they, if, if that is true, what he said is that we teach up to emancipation and you want to talk about numbers, then that means that the next time that they start discussing us is 89 years later when they start to discuss the civil rights movement. Because the civil rights movement started in around 1954, what as far as what they call the civil rights era. When in actuality, just in doing my research, I actually know that it started before then because I had an uncle who was a part of the National Negro Congress who was doing that at Howard University that was founded at Howard University in around about 1940. So if you really think about it, it's 89 years from 1865 to 1954. But then when you go even deeper into it, they really don't start talking about the civil rights. And when you talk about the civil rights era, you're first mentioning, um, Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King didn't jump into it until the 60s. Mm-hmm. So, so some of the things in, that by emphasizing that emanci- emancipation, that's kind of when the education stopped. And actually thinking about it, it did in my school, my high school, when I, which I went to in the 1980s. That was it. We hit emancipation and you would think it was kumbaya afterwards for black people, that equality was out there for everybody. 
I mean, clearly I knew that that didn't happen because I knew what my own family's lived black experience was, even, even in New England. But these are just some of the big ticket items that get left out if you stop teaching about our history at emancipation. So then you have the things that happen directly around emancipation, like the Devil's Punch Bowl, which happened in Mississippi in 1865, where tens of thousands of newly freed men and women and their kids were gathered up, put in this place that, pardon the language, can only be described as a hellhole, where to this day, they don't know how many African Americans died. There, there were thousands thousands of them died. If you want to Google it, it's called the Devil's Punch Bowl, 1865, Mississippi. Horrific. Then, in the 1880s, Black people started to try to organize their labor. Kind of think of them as really early kind of labor um, labor unions. So then you have things like the Thibodeau Sugarcane Massacre. That's 1887. That happened down in Louisiana. Again, horrific bit of history. Then fast forward to 1921, we have the Tulsa Race Massacre. And we have many, many massacres that are happening around that time. I think there was Asheville in North Carolina. There was one in New York. There was one in New Jersey. They were just happening all over the place, roughly not in that time. Not only were they happening, not only, not only were they that not um, happening during that time period, but they had been happening before then, because there were several in South Carolina as well. This is true. And, you know, so you, those, the, the massacres were happening. Good Lord. There were so many of them. It was ridiculous. And there's still some that we really don't know about. Then you completely skate over the existence of the Ku Klux Klan or the Red Shirts. I forget which one started first or if they started roughly around the same time. And their reign of, you know, their terrorism. There's, there's no other way to describe those organizations other than white terrorist organizations that targeted not only black people, <clears throat> they targeted Catholics because they got Italians, they targeted Irish people, um, they targeted Jewish people, they targeted Muslim people. Um, so we just completely kind of what, academically, we just pretend that they never existed. Then you get the Red Spring of 1919, where black workers again tried to organize their labor, which led to just a raft of lynchings and black people being run out of run out of towns and cities all over the country. Then we're going to ignore the fact that sundown towns and whole sundown counties actually existed. Yes, um, but I think the one thing that you that even you left out just now, Reconstruction era. Mm -hmm. never taught that's never taught in school that is that they don't go into the detail of the reconstruction era you know that's that's one of my biggest issues right there guys because that's where you start to learn that at some point for a brief moment black people actually had a seat at the table and can and they, i'm just going to piggyback off of you really quick black people you know when they were in state and national and federal legislature weren't drafting laws just to help black people during reconstruction. They were drafting laws that helped everybody. Everybody. That's right. Back to you. That's exactly it. No, you're absolutely right. That's the whole thing. That's what I mean by we had a seat at the table because it wasn't just for them. It wasn't just about us. It was about everyone. So at, during that time period, having all of, and they were, and they, and they had so, it was so many African-Americans that was a part of it. First of all, we came out of slavery running, building schools with, with other white abolitionists who were, you know, we were building, that's how the HBCUs came to pass. Now you got every black school counted as an HBCU and it shouldn't be. But I've heard people actually include other black school, other black schools that are not HBCUs. They've actually include them as a historically black college or university. First and foremost, historically, what constitutes a historically black college or university is the fact that it was created 
during the Reconstruction era and maybe, what, a couple of years after it or mm -hmm. something like that. But overall, that's what is a an HBCU. And people just don't even realize that that's what that is, whereas there are some schools that are just not HBCUs. And the there Reconstruction... Are schools are not. And there's re the Reconstruction period was like the Black Renaissance, where yeah. you had doctors, lawyers, yeah. magistrates, judges, yeah. teachers, business yeah. people. Um, think about pretty much any kind of industry or profession that existed back in the day. Newspapers, editors, authors. Senators, I mean, there were always kind of... There were newspapers and, and authors, you know, before that amongst free people of color, but it really took off during Reconstruction. Senators, there was congressmen, no... everything, you know, you just, the oh, things you were... that you, you can't hear me? Mm -mm. Not at all? Am I on? It's dropped. Can you, can you hear me now? It's really faint. While Dying is sorting out her um her volume, there there was no aspect of American life back then that was not touched by this by this Black Renaissance. Just as you said, towns were started. Um, that's where you get the birth of kind of again black you know black commas. You get the homesteaders. They're going out there. They're trying to achieve their their version of the the American dream. Try it again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can, but it it is faint. That's weird. I don't know why. Hmm. We can hear you. It's just it's just going to be faint. Okay. I can. Mm -hmm. So what? So what were you? You were. So you can. Pick oh, up from I was there. just saying. I was saying senators and congressmen. You know, we were still. We were a part of so much that happened during that time that it was crazy, and all of it was left out of history books. Every last bit of it was just was left out of history books. So Brian, it's according to our guests, our, our audience, they can hear me. Okay. So it may be you. Okay. Well, so long as they can hear you, yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's the important thing. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. Um. So that kind of that that disturbed me when they because again whether there was whether governors were saying the quiet part out loud or thinking they were being clever. That the fact that they emphasized emancipation as the kind of cutoff point, and. I'm going to, again going to throw it back to you, Don. Yet, even keeping it to slavery and emancipation wasn't great, because you and I have both called out textbook publishers for inaccurately writing about and you know these are textbooks that are used in schools. I think they were all coming out of Texas. One was coming out of Virginia that was providing incorrect information about slavery. They were calling. First of all, they were making everyone smile. All the enslaved people smile, making them look, everyone look like they were happy, and they were calling them servants. And that that really upset you. Let me tell you how much that that I was going to curse. Let me tell you how much that just that um that made me angry. Yes, because in Texas, the Scholastic book was the name. It's Scholastic. I can't think of the name of them, but according to them. Labor, but enslaved people were considered workers. That that's what it was. They they are listed as workers when they talk about the enslaved people. They're not discussed as people who were enslaved. When you hear a worker, you think of someone who is actually being paid. And my great great grandmother, I don't know about y'all's, but my great great grandmother wasn't being paid. She just, you know, she wasn't being paid for what she did. So I'm going to need people to, I, I, that has to be fixed. And we we sent messages, sent emails, and they actually came off and they said that they would change it in their online books, but it was never changed in their paper books. Yeah, never changed. And the other aspects that 
again, don't really get taught or discussed are things like policing and judicial, you know, and the kind of justice that that's meted out to that has been meted out to African Americans. We know that the police force, as we kind of think of it today, and again, we have two wonderful as episodes with um, Police Chief Gottby that people can watch on demand where we go into this much, much more in detail. But the police force, as we know it today, had its origins in slave catchers. And the basic, you know, the black codes and the black statutes that were on the books um, going all the way back to the slavery period. And again, on the phone to, to Donia, yeah, I, I noticed the difference in how white people are punished and how black people are punished. Now, this isn't a brilliant analogy because one was a cult and one wasn't, but I'm going to use Waco, Texas as one example. That was the cult. So horrible ending. We know a lot of people died. There was a fire. It was horrible. But what did the, what did the, the law enforcement agencies use against them? tear gas. Now, fast forward to the MOVE organization in Philadelphia. Crazy what was used back. against them? Bombs, literal bombs in residential areas of Philadelphia. No tear gas. It's always extra. When it comes to the punishment of Black, of black and African Americans, it is always extra. Well, we can. I can give one. Uh, I can give one even more, even more recent. Um, with the George Floyd thing, not one of those police officers ever thought to go to a newspaper, a news um, group, and try to arrest them. They would push them back. They would tell them they had to go, or this, that, and the third. And they allowed that to happen. But what happened to the black CNN group? They got arrested. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, they did. it just it actually just hit me, but they got arrested. Do you I, and I don't I want people to really understand and y'all chime in real quick, you know, just I don't care if you're hitting the like button or matter of fact, that's what I want you to do. Hit the like or the love button if what I'm about to say is not true. How many of you guys thought that you weren't going to see that young black um that young black guy again? How, did it not cross your mind that you weren't going to see him again? Did he did because of the fact that he was black? Because I know it crossed mine. I, it scared me to death that he got arrested, and I was just afraid that something was going to happen to them. So y'all, let me know. Tell me if you actually think if something was going to happen to him or not. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. So the other thing that you mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> the and the thing that you mentioned to me, Don, when we were chatting about the the show on the phone, was the difference between the war on drugs. So whether it's conspiracy theory or whether it's true, there is the belief within the African American kind of national community that crack cocaine was pumped into urban black and black neighborhoods by the federal government. That was a that was a self done perpetuated crisis that was created by the government that we didn't get support or health care for or counseling for or intervention well, mental, for mental you know nothing we didn't get any of those things and now you have the opioid crisis you have these um, people who and they're because because they're mostly white that are being hooked on these different things and you mean to tell me that you couldn't have reacted that way with us it's always been a difference it's always mm -hmm. been stronger it's always you know and we are always exaggerating when we say these things it's always an exaggeration when we say these things as well that's the part that gets me mm -hmm. why am i exaggerating why am i why am i you know but I'm going to ask you a question, Donia. Do you think that part of it is because this is such a caste-orientated, racial and ethnically separated country that I'm thinking about the town that I grew up in. 
which is not that way anymore. But when I grew up there, it was over, it was 98% white. So that meant everything was 98% white. The school system, where, you know, if you wanted to get a little summertime or after school job, that was white. The churches were white. Everything was majority, predominantly white. And these are conversations that I try to have with some of my former high school, my former schoolmates who, who come from the same town, because they really don't know Black people. They don't speak to them. They don't work with them. They don't live near them. They don't live around them. As a matter of fact, the two kind of small cities, large towns that were near us, New London and Groton, had much larger non-white populations, both Spanish speaking and um, Asian as well as, as well as African descended. And to hear my town speak about those two towns, you would think you were going into some of the worst war zones in Connecticut. Forget going to New Haven or Bridgeport, which were cities and had even larger kind of ethnic populations. There was just this complete othering. So when they come at me about black people exaggerate, things aren't as bad as you say they are. I'm like, well, how do you know? You don't know Black people. You've never lived the Black experience. You never lived in a Black area. You've never really worked with a number of Black people. Where are your opinions coming from? And they, they really, apart from, other than things like Fox News and Breitbart, whatever kind of information sources they have, that's it. They're, they're forming opinions that if, about us about our lives and our community and our people without a factual basis. Well, some of them may not even watch Fox News or Breitbart or anything like that, and they just get it from who their family is. There's it's, that too. It's all about who taught them. I'm I'm the person, and I'm not saying that Brian isn't, but what I would so please don't misunderstand. But I'm the one that always looks at the I, I always look at the other side. And I'm always trying to, I'm not, like, you guys have gotten angry at me because I I will take, I will look at slavery and I can actually see the bad part that white, that affected the white people too. I, I can see that and I'll acknowledge that. And I mean, because I've had people to get upset at me because I'm like, oh, they'll say things like, well, White people didn't go through what we went through and white people didn't this, this, that, and the third as far as slavery is concerned. And I totally agree. And I and you're absolutely right. However, you're not going to sit here and tell me that what that allowing your five-year-old baby to sit there and watch a hanging and think that that is okay. You won't let your child watch a scary movie today. So is that not the, the equivalent of a scary movie for a child to see that and then to watch them shoot them for shooting practice and pieces of their skin, body parts coming off and then taking it home? That's a movie in real life for them. So you're not going to sit here and tell me that that's not an issue as well. I, I'm not... I, I, I can't, I can't look at it like that. And yes, ma'am, I am using the word equivalent. I have used the word equivalent for that child to see something so detrimental. You are not going to allow your child to see that in a movie, let alone see it live. You're never going to let that happen. You're just not. You're never going to let that happen. And if you do, then people question why you're doing it. So that's why I say the things that I say. So when, when, when Brian, when we were talking, when we're talking about what we were just saying, yes, there are, there are things that are happening that we have to look at both sides in order to understand it so that we can move forward with it. Oh, thank you, Angela. I thought you was against it. My bad, baby. No. <laughs> <laughs> but because I got people that come that, that just don't, they don't see it. They they don't always see it. But, mm -hmm. you know. So, again, just focusing on Ron DeSantis at the minute, but I have heard variations of this 
by some of the other governors that I'm that I mentioned at the top of the show. So part of his argument is that the left and that African Americans and socialists, because you know they always have to extreme us. Um, that that's that's always a good deflection. He's saying that some of this is being used for political purposes to kind of indoctrinate kids and make white kids feel guilty about being white. Now, he said, which isn't true, history is history. How people choose to respond and feel to facts and dates and this stuff actually happen, that's not anyone's control. It's not about making people feel guilty. It's about linking the present to the past, explaining how we got to the past to the present, and everything that goes with it. But he called out two things that I found fascinating. So we know that Florida has, it's not called the Don't Say Gay Bill, but basically people refer to it as the Don't Say Gay Bill. And actually they're referring to this whole thing as the Don't Say Black thing. So he was objecting about inclusion of content about the Black LGBTQ experience. Now, I've never studied that as part of a Black Studies course or conversation, but I'm going to presume as an academic and as a former academic that the reason why that's being discussed is, well, if there's racism in every, and bias in every other part of the the lived American experience for African American, I'm sure that that must exist in the LGBTQ community, and that's perhaps what they're talking about what that looks like, how that feels to be on the receiving end of it. I mean, if that applies to anyone who's watching and they want to comment on that, by all means, please do. That, that's me coming from a, a point of subjection. Um, but I'm sure that that's probably why that was included in, in this particular AP course. The other thing that kind of, I had to take a deep breath, he was going after Black feminists. And again, I have not read academic literature about Black feminism, but I know about the denial of African-American women in things like voting rights. You know, back in the day in the early 1900s when women were fighting for the, for the vote, Black women were fighting alongside them, but you'd never know that if you read the history books. It's all about the white women who did it. And there are challenges that are unique and have always been unique for Black women always. So why wouldn't there be a substrand of Black studies, of African-American studies, that focuses on African-American women's feminism? And I want to piggyback on the voting, because one of the things that got under my skin was when they honored, who was it Harriet Tubman? They were honoring Harriet Tubman um, as during the 100 years of women vote to rights to vote. Brian and I were talking about it. And when we were talking about it, I don't know if you remember, I said, well, that's not for me. And he kind of looked at me for a minute because he had to remember what it was I was saying. He was like, what? I said, black women didn't get the right to vote 100 years ago. And he was like, oh my God, We, we, we didn't, we didn't. But we fought for it. You had the Delta Sigma Theta sororities literally marching right beside them. Not necessarily beside them, of course, because during the time period, but they were right there. They had a whole hand in in women getting the right to vote, but not Black women. But you look at me and when I'm coming and I'm responding to you in a certain type of way, you feel like I'm being angry. Like it's the most, as a black woman, I can't, I can't even put into words how much all of those different things affect me. I I cannot put it into words. I don't know. And I really want y'all to chime in today. I mean, you guys are putting up stuff, but I want to know, you know, Hit the like button, hit the love button. Tell me how you feel because these are things that are important as far as black history is concerned that people need to start 
you know, I will give you another example. I remember my DC maternal grandmother talking about how it felt to have her own bank account, her own bank account mm. in her name, not my grandfather's name, not her husband's name, her bank account. And I think that didn't happen until the late 1970s, maybe mm -hmm. early 80s. I know I was either just about on the cusp of being a teenager or I had just become a teenager. Yeah, more than likely. I mean, the, our history is such an important role in America. That's ridiculous. Literally, if you want to take it from, from slavery and beyond, it is one. It is very, very important because, truth be told, there's always a reset that goes on in America. It's all. It's always that goes on in the world. There's always something that happens that makes the reset. Well, the reset for us was the ending of the uh, um, of of slavery. That was a reset button, and in that reset button, created the Reconstruction era. Era, and in that era. That's when we all had a hand in what was going on. They didn't like it. The powers that be didn't like it. So and they, they reset. And they, and reset, they reset, reset the reset button. That's it. They reset yet again. So, mm. you know, it. those are the things that we have to, you know, everything is always something. It's always a reset. It's always a reset. And every time somebody points something out about it, they reset it. Or again, or if it doesn't go in the direction that they want it to go, the powers that be go, then it gets reset again. So you know, and there's no, there's no, in my opinion, there is no avoiding any of this, because even if you're just a hobbyist genealogist or a hobbyist family history researcher, if you're if you're black and African American, you are going to come up against this stuff or aspects of this sooner or later. None of us escape this. Even free, and you know, we spend a lot of time talking about slavery and and post slavery. Free people of color didn't have it easy either. They may have been free, but they were not white free. They were not equal to white people. Let's just get real about that. And just some quick examples that come off the top of my head on that one is right after the Nat Turner Rebellion. All of those northern North Carolina counties that straddled Virginia and those southern Virginia counties that straddled North Carolina, it's kind of the region that he that he came from, you could not be, you could not legally own a gun for a long time after that. That's where you start seeing laws being written about how many black people could congregate, laws that prohibited free people of color from speaking to enslaved people, um, it was the it was it was the fear factor. So, and even when they start, that's when you start seeing a lot of family groups leaving that particular part of North Carolina, creating free people of color communities in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, and they still didn't get a break. They still weren't cut a break. But again, this is where the history, the knowing of this stuff happens because I know when I'm looking, researching my extended free people of color family from Wake County, Northampton County, Halifax, all around that part in North Carolina, Southampton County, Virginia, all around there. When it looks as though they've dropped off the face of the earth, I know where to look for them. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. Mm -hmm. That's where they all went to. Well, so LaCrosse knowing that history actually helps my research, you know, but also understanding that history is just important for for American history students. Right. Well, LaCrista Sims just brought up something that was really, um, it's not off topic. She said it was, but it's not. She said it actually will pull us into another area of what we wanted to discuss. She said, this may be off topic, but it was on the news that the Holocaust would be taught in schools, but they have a problem with CRT. Now, first and foremost, I, I don't know about anybody else. I'm, I will be 51 this year, and I do remember the Holocaust being taught in school. I remember learning something about it. It may not have gone into detail, but I do remember learning something about the Holocaust in school. But let me give the definition 
of CRT. The definition of CRT is this. It's a set of ideas holding that racial bias is inherent in many parts of Western society, especially in its legal and social institutions on the basis of their having been primarily designed for and implemented by white people. That don't have nothing to do with school. <clears throat> No, it's a legal course, and it's not it's even a, taught in every. It's not even taught in every law school. It's only taught in a handful of them, right. and that's basically to get people to understand racism and implicit bias in the judicial system, particularly sentencing of non-white people. That that's yes. that, that's all it's there for, but yes. it's so, but she does raise um, a really interesting point because even the Holocaust is in the rifle sites. Because they've tried, or they have, or they've tried to ban, these are school boards, and again, educational kind of boards. They don't want Anne Frank being read, and there's another book called Mouse. They don't want that being read. And do you want to know the argument that they use for both the Holocaust and African American history? Well, this only presents one viewpoint. It doesn't present a counter viewpoint. How, what counter viewpoint is there to the Holocaust other than the Nazis? That's the, the polar viewpoint. What's the credible, what's the alternative to the African American experience of slavery? Well, it's the enslavers viewpoint. And we had that. It was called the Civil War. You want to read the opposing viewpoints, you know, the, the, the defense of slavery, read what they wrote, you know, read what these people were writing from the, the slave owning states. That's your alternative viewpoint. But there is no moral viewpoint to the opposition of slavery. They're just, just like there isn't one for the Holocaust. Um, and sometimes I just wonder if this is just blatant cynicism on their part, or again, they just are, these, you know, the people who espouse these statements aren't even thinking about what they're saying. They're just saying it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, you know, when you and I were discussing this before, um, the one thing that I've noticed, and this is just like just with people as a whole, but one thing that we do is we look at, we will, let's say somebody gets into an argument with someone and you only pick out the ones, the words that takes you to another level, when in actuality, if you listen to the whole statement, the whole comment that's being made, that's when you get when a person, when you're having one of those heated conversations and you may be able to respond better. The bottom line is, is that the English language, almost every word has a double meaning to it. Mm -hmm. So every time we listen to a conversation, when we're in a, within a conversation, you know, in a conversation with each other, we have to look at the context at the context that the word is being used as opposed to the actual definition of the mm. word at that particular moment. Because it all depends on the context of how it's being used. Can I give and you an example? The problems. Can I give you an example? And this is from my own personal example. So it was after the, the horrific incident with George Floyd. And then all of a sudden I was hearing a phrase I'd never heard before, which was defund the police. And even I had a knee-jerk reaction to that. I'm like, what the heck is that? Are you talking about literally taking money away from the police? But this is what I would think a rational person would do, that they would do what I did, rather than get in my feelings about it or start making assumptions about what that phrase meant. I went online and I Googled it and I found out the kind of origin, the, the people who had come up with that phrase, and what it was really all about. Now, do I wish that they had actually come up with a different phrase? Absolutely. Because it doesn't mean what people, what the people on the right want you to think it means. You know, I, do I wish that they had said, let's reimagine what policing looks like? Reimagining policing or, you know, redefining policing or something along those lines. Because I, mean, I guess I felt that that original phrase was really punitive. And I was like, oh, how is that going to work? And things like that work against us. Because again, Donnie, on the phone, I was saying, 
we are African Americans who push back against the oppression and the, the systems that have been put in place to keep us down. First go to is to cast us as socialists. We're always painted as extremists. And the irony, the kind of irony of it is, is this is actually coming from proper extremists. But we're the ones who are talking about social justice, social equality, financial equality, healthcare equality, environmental equality. We're the ones who get kind of tarred with, with that brush. Um, or we're just made to sound like we're idiots. Oh, look at them. They want to take money away from their, you know, they want to disband their police departments and take take money away from them. We're very few. I mean, I'm not saying that no one's saying that, but very few people are actually saying that. When you boil it down, defund the police is we need to reimagine what policing black communities or marginalized communities looks like, feels like, what that experience of it should be, rather than what it is. Right. So sometimes yeah. I feel as though we don't we don't help ourselves on that one. No, we um, don't, I mean we don't we don't help ourselves ourselves at all. I totally agree with that. And the other thing I wanted to touch on because we had a great conversation of it. I think you can speak on your behalf. I'll speak on mine. I think that a lot of this pushback from the from the hard conservatives is because they don't want their they don't want their grandkids or their great grandkids to know what grandma and grandpa got up to in the 50s and 60s. And I'm going to use Jerry Jones as an example. He is the owner of the, uh, the, the um, Cowboys uh, football club. So it has re it relatively recently came to light that when he was in Arkansas in high school, he was there amongst a group of teenage boys at a high school um, that was being integrated. And there's a picture that's been floating around all over social media. It is him. He has not denied that it's him. Um, of a young teenage African-American male, someone that looks like it may be his father because the, the, other, the, other, the other guy looks older than him, amongst these kind of laughing, jeering teenage boy faces. Now, Jerry is saying, well, I was just there because I was curious. How could you be there if you were just curious? Everyone knew what was happening that day. Everyone knew what was happening that day. What did he think was going to happen for him to be curious? Now, this is where our conversation got interesting, because we don't think that everyone that made a mistake in the past should be canceled or fired. You know, if you can demonstrate that you've learned from that experience, I'm a believer in, in second chances. Now, Jerry's history kind of, I'm a bit dubious about whether he did learn any lessons, but you had, you had quite a bit to say about that, Donia. Well, what I said about that was, again, this is me being the flip, on the flip side. I'm the kind of person, and I don't know if, if Jerry Jones has learned it, but, let, but what if he did? Do you, do you fire him? Or what if he's now teaching his people to be a certain way? So I think, you know, what if he's letting them know, you know, you shouldn't be this way. So I'll take the other, the opposite example. And that was with the, um, the Governor Northam. Virginia, yeah, the former Virginia go governor, Governor Northam. He was in a, in a photo. He was, he admitted that it may be him in that photo with the, Blackface, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. He had that was in blackface. Well, since that time, he put out there, I've learned, i I know what things are going on. So do you still fault him at that point? Because what if he actually has, what if he has moved forward and and has made a, a, a 180 degree turn to go the way that he should be going? because he learned from what was going on then. So I, I think that in order for us to move forward as a people, there has to be a moment and a time where we're going to be able to trust. Is that difficult specifically for black people? Without a doubt, because throughout time, we have always been hit in the back in some way, shape or form. But in the same instance, 
there is always a group that is always there to help too. <laughs> They're always there. It's always been like yeah. that, even into slavery. And, you know, things, I, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're ways, they're people. I have, um, I think, and I think what supports this for me the most is our white colleagues, our genealogy, genealogical white colleagues. They get it. They literally get it. They understand that what we were, what our families went through back then they don't want to let it happen again. Mm -hmm. So they help us. They help us on those moments where you have those court documents and you go in the ads form and they say, oh, they're not available right now. You know, they're in the process. But then a white person goes in and asks for those same documents and they're handed over to them. Now they step up and like, you want me to go and get that for you? Even mm -hmm. though they know and they understand and they're mad and they're angry that they have to be the ones to be able to go and get this they still realize that this craziness is still going on and it's got to be something that we can do to help. Mm -hmm. so. Well, again, there's a wonderful documentary from Vice. I wish I could remember what it's called. I've seen um, also other documentaries on YouTube where you have had avowed racists, you've had Klan members, the lot, white supremacists, who kind of had the epiphany and they came out the other side and they talk about their experiences. They talk about what led them to believe what they believed to begin with. And then what kind of pulled them out of that to become actual allies. Um, right. So it can happen. It can. And, you know, I don't, I, no way do I think that they should be punished because the environment that they were reared in or raised in or the communities that they were part of instilled that hatred for non-white people in them. At the end, they saw the light and they came out the other side and not only came out the other side, they're like, you know, each one of the men that I'm thinking of, you know, they became, you know, they are hardcore allies now. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I know, I, I, I get it. I know it's hard to to trust, especially when you do the research and you see what your families went through is, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with y'all. Once I started doing my research, I had a slight issue with white women. I'm not even going to lie. Because, and I'm going to tell you why. My reasoning was because I started to learn that white women were harsher on black enslaved people than white men they were harsher and it 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 began to scare me a little bit because i was like well wait a minute hold on and then when you start thinking about all the different times throughout history and the things that have been going on you got emmett till and what happened to emmett till lady said that she, he whistled and he didn't he didn't do any of those things. He, you know, it wasn't like that. And now what's the um what's the, the counter to what's the what's the, the equivalent to that? Now, what did they call her? Bodega Betty? That mm -hmm. was the lady that actually went off and told that child and, and tried to this is a 10-year-old kid. Oh my god, he touched my butt. Are you kidding me? You literally just set him up just like that. So I was just so, I, I began to get so afraid of it. But then what helped me learn how to move past it is all of my white colleagues, my white friends that I have known since cousins. 12 years old, my white cousins. So it's not everyone. Like you can take these, you can take these experiences and you can actually see them and see them happening again. You see the experiences of your families and then you turn around and you see it happening again 50 and 60 years later and you're like, oh my God. But then in the same instance, you can look at that person that's always been had your back and she's not your complexion. Mm -hmm. you so also there's have always something. 
and you also we also have wonderful organizations like coming to the table that yeah. brings together descendants of both the enslavers and the enslaved literally around a table um to start having those bonds we've had a great show with hamad um hamad where he met his three white settles cousins again our. you can our, our. Yeah, sorry, our, our white Settles cousins, but he met them our first. Our Settles cousins, yes. He met them first. Um, and again, you can watch that on demand on our, on our YouTube channel. And, you know, the thing is, you know, I'm not saying that we've all developed those deep family relationships with all of our white cousins, but we have made those deep family connections with, with many, many of our white cousins. Right. Um, and we've had, you know, and we've had those difficult conversations. Right. And Sandra Abrams says you have to judge folks as an individual. And you're absolutely right. However, Black people are not judged as individuals. Mm -hmm. If one Black person does something wrong, we all doing the same thing. And that's what makes it, it, makes it so difficult. Yeah. That's what makes things so difficult. You got so, one Black person that acts a certain way and then everybody, you know, oh, we're all, they all act. Like that. Yeah. So Black history is threatening? No. No, it is not threatening. Is it hard? Is it difficult? Is part large parts of it bound to make people feel uncomfortable? Yes. yes. But we should be. And why should we? Because as a country, the majority it's never going to be everybody, but the majority. I would be happy if 65% decided to have a hard conversation about it, draw a line under it, and make a commitment to never replicating any part of it ever again mm. against Amen. anyone. doesn't even have to be us. It could be Spanish-speaking people, Asian people, I, Native Americans, right. polka, polka dot people. Don't care. We draw a line under it, learn from it, and vow to never do it again to anyone. I agree. I definitely agree. That is awesome. So, okay, we are at a close, but next week we will be talking to the King Kofa. Is that the name of it? Mm -hmm. It yeah. is. We will be speaking with them and they will be sharing stories and the things that they do to help push African Americans forward. Again, this is our Black History Month 2023 Black History Month series. We are so, so glad that you guys are back for joining us, just like we are so, so glad that we are back talking with you. And we wait, can't wait to see you again next Sunday. And we will see you next Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in all of our usual places. Until then, have a blessed Sunday. We'll see you next week. Thank you, you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.